Welcome to CHQ Assembly. I'm Sylvia Bennett, Senior Vice President and Chief Development Officer for Buffalo Toronto Public Media. It's my pleasure to host this program where we learn of an incredible new production, The Chevalier. This production is the centerpiece of an international advocacy campaign for racial representation in orchestra ecology. The Chevalier was written by Bill Barclay, who will also direct its performance at both the Venetian Theatre at Caramore on July 10th and the historic Chautauqua Institution Amphitheater on July 16th, later this summer. Today, Bill joins us virtually to discuss the play's influence and importance. Along with Bill, we will be speaking with Liz Player, Executive and Artistic Director of Harlem Chamber Players, Kathy Schumann, Artistic Director at Caramore, and in studio with us is Deborah Sunea Moore, Senior Vice President and Chief Program Officer at Chautauqua Institution. Our guests today will be sharing their or organization's advocacy for diversifying classical music. I don't wish to lead all the time. It's a violin sonata. It's a sonata for violin and piano. And you're quite good, Your Highness. It's a solo piece with accompaniment. It's a conversation. You're supposed to have the tune. I want the voices to be equal. You don't like dominance. I don't like power. Not over others. The king has created a new force, the police de Noir. They are registering blacks to bring them back to slavery on the islands. We fight for slavery's abolishment, Wolfgang. That is why my address must stay strictly private. Do you understand? Oh, just program me in your orchestra. I'll even write you something with no development so they'll think I'm a proper Parisian. G, 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 E, F, G, A, B, C. C, G, G, C, G, E, G, 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 G
There's an extraordinary biography written by Gabriel Benat, who was a Romanian-American violinist who died maybe about 10 years ago. And this is an impeccably researched biography. It's a vast improvement on the few biographies that were before it, and it includes a number of primary sources in there to back up his findings. Uh, Bernat was also a musicologist, a violinist, as I mentioned, and so his, uh, his insights into the music and the man were very inspiring to me. And that was just the first source, and then I got as much of Boulogne's music as I could in order to try to understand the man's personality through his compositions. And then it was about reading about the people around him who were most interesting to a version of Boulogne's story that I could tell, namely Marie Antoinette, um, a heinously misunderstood figure in history, and Mozart, who in a, in a small paragraph in Bernard's bi biography uh, was declared to be housemates with Joseph Boulogne for three months in 1778. So the dramatic possibilities of these three characters conversing right before the French Revolution began uh, was was uh, just too tempting to ignore. And then the politics of the French, French Revolution really imitating what the world was going through in 2019 and 2020 uh, made me realize that history was rhyming and that there was a way to really showcase the problems that we were having politically today by examining this particular decade in history. Excellent. So I understand that two performers share Boulogne's role. So talk about how this works and why you chose to do it in that manner. One of the greatest compliments to who Joseph Boulogne was is that I really genuinely believe that there is no person alive today who could play Joseph Boulogne. Um, no one person. He was not only a virtuoso violinist, but he was apparently the best dancer in Paris. He was a marksman. Uh, he was uh, obviously the best fencer uh, in, in, in France, if not all of Europe. Um, he was a conductor, he was a composer. I mean, he was a knight of the king. He was apparently an expert swimmer. This was a total one-off individual. And dramatically, we present him with two performers. And there's an actor and a violinist dressed the same. The audience immediately understands that they're the same person. What this allows is more than the sum of its parts. We don't want to find the unicorn who can play Joseph Boulogne. We like the theatrical possibilities that we get out of having two performers. The actor playing Joseph Boulogne is in every scene, and then the musician is playing in almost every music cue. And so it allows these two performers to really be more than one. It allows it to be um, sort of more spectacular theatrically. And ultimately, it's a tip of the hat to Boulogne to say, there is no one like you today. And that's exactly the kind of message we want to send with this piece. Excellent. So, Bill, tell us what your hopes are for this piece beyond the performance. We want to tour as many orchestras as we can. Since the Black Lives Matter movement, a lot of orchestras are playing the one or two pieces of Boulogne uh, and then moving on. And we want to feature a deeper examination of this composer to inspire other orchestras to not only examine some of these composers that they've neglected for years, not only minorities, but women, um, but to look for other marginalized figures and help us understand the story of who they are against the music that they made. Bill, let's tell us, what are some of the major themes you're exploring with this piece? I suppose the biggest is what is the nature of equality? Is it 50-50 even? Is it equity? What do we mean when we say equal? In studying some of Boulogne's chamber music, it's clear that he, for example, in a violin keyboard sonata, he gives the piano the melody, which no other composer was doing at that time in that way. In the string quartets, he's moving the, the solo line among the voices, which was also something that it's hard to find other composers doing, and no one was doing it in France. It's almost like he's trying to flatten the hierarchy of musicians and have the composers breathe together and listen together and be more than the sum of their parts. You know, it's almost as if he's sort of coding equality or democracy or democratic ideals into his music. Instead of lead or an ensemble, there's a more, more interesting exchange of ideas going on. And I try to examine his music through his music lessons with Marie Antoinette, who was a very shrewd musician as well. And so it's a little bit behind the music in order to connect 
political ideas with musical ideas and to see the Chevalier as the first real artist advocate. And artist advocacy is something that obviously we're doing in creating the play. So one of the themes is what does it mean to be an artist advocate versus saying, well, I'm, I'm an artist and I, I can't get political or I don't get political. You know, what does it mean to not hide behind that and say, no, I'm taking a stand and I'm gonna take a stand by studying a piece of history that rhymes with today. Balone was doing that and he was doing that at great risk to his life. And so we wanna highlight that and tell the true story of what that is as best we can, which is difficult because he was very discreet. He wasn't writing screeds or pamphlets about what he believed, he was writing music. And obviously that's through a glass darkly with any composer. So we're treading carefully, but trying to elevate what he really thought about the politics of the day and air those through an argument between two characters in, in this case, it's Marie Antoinette and Boulogne that really have the biggest fat to chew. That's a big theme, equality, uh, artist advocacy, and then of course, uh, race and, and revolution, other big things that were very problematic in Paris at that time, 10 years before the, the French Revolution, and obviously just on the tip of everyone's brains today in some form. Bill, thank you. Liz, now we're turning to you. Tell us a bit about why the Harlem Chamber Players was founded and what its mission is. Sure. We started uh, during the summer of 2008. And at the time, I wasn't sure what we would be doing with this series. I was inspired by this Jewish woman by the name of Janet Wolf who had founded the um, New York City Housing Symphony Orchestra in 1971. And it stayed around uh, for over 40 years. She died at the age of 101, 101 in uh, 2015. And so I didn't know about this orchestra until very late in my life. I played clarinet back then. And I remember the first time I sat in that orchestra, uh, it was during the late 1990s. It was the first time I played in an orchestra full of Black musicians and Latinx musicians who looked just like me. And the feeling I got from that was just very warm. It was fun. It was an experience I never had before. And I didn't know that there were so many uh, talented, classically trained musicians of color who looked just like me. And that just really touched me. And since then I got more involved with that organization and I wound up helping Janet with her annual concerts uh, at Wyo Recital Hall at Carnegie Hall. And there I met a violist by the name of Charles Dalton. And I also love chamber music more than anything else. Uh, uh, as Bill was talking about Chevalier de St. George's music, what I love about uh, chamber music is that every performer is a soloist in that music and you interact with one another. And so that really drew me. And that's what I really wanted to play. And so I told this violist friend of mine at the time about this dream of mine to just uh, play music. And so we created a summer music festival for concerts uh, between June to August which was overly ambitious for a first time, but we did it. And uh, from there, it grew into a regular series. Uh, at the time, we parted ways, we had our differences. And then I met uh, someone else, a clarinetist by the name of Carl Jackson, who was also my partner. And uh, since then, in about 2009 or 2010, we gave it an official name. Actually, he thought of it, uh, the Harlem Chamber Players. And we decided to just create a regular ongoing series and to just um, present musicians of color who are underrepresented in the classical music arena. And so then that's part of what our mission is to bring accessible and affordable music uptown to Harlem and, while also providing opportunities for classically trained musicians of color who are underrepresented. That's really fantastic. So Liz, tell me, why do you think certain music and musicians have been overlooked and forgotten historically? That's a really tough question. You have to go back and hear history and we just have to look within ourselves. And uh, this, this art form uh, is a European art form and we're steeped in Eurocentrism, white supremacy, and a lot of uh, Black people who did study classical music later were just purposely excluded from the field. Um, you know, even growing up learning classical music, 
I had no idea who William Grant still was or Florence Price, Chevalier de St. George, none of these composers. I never studied any of them. I only knew about Brahms, Debussy, Stravinsky, Bach, um, you know, all of the uh, European composers that were all taught in schools. And it wasn't until I played in this uh, New York City Housing Symphony Orchestra that I met a composer by the name of George Kay, uh, a black woman who um, who introduced us to this music. And I, I'm sorry, I got her name wrong. It's Kay George Roberts. And she was an expert in black classical music. And it was just really exciting. And I wanted to learn more about it. Uh, but, you know, right now, uh, you know, I've heard I've um read heartbreaking letters when Florence Price wanted her music played, writing a letter to Kusevitsky asking uh, for her music to play. But in her introduction, she said, I have two handicaps, that of sex and that, uh, you know, and that she is a woman. And, you know, so I think we're trying to come out of that now, but we still have a long way to go. Yeah, exactly. So, Bill, coming back to you for a minute, tell us a little bit about how you collaborated with the Harlem Chamber Players and, you know, how does the experience, you know, for the audience differ when it's that group? We're really looking forward to working with Liz's fantastic ensemble on this production. The model for Concert Theatre Works, my company, is we go to where the ensemble is, the orchestra is. So the tour of the Chevalier involves... Uh, every new city, we get a different group of players to get to interact with. And uh, we're really looking forward to collaborating with Liz's musicians. Um, uh, hers is the only ethnically diverse ensemble that we'll be playing with in uh, this year. And that obviously is, is a, a, will be a beautiful moment for uh, myself, for my actors, for the people who have invested time, blood, sweat and tears in making this material what it is. And we just, I just can't say how excited I am about it. That's great. So tell us a little bit about how Caramore will do it. And then here at Chautauqua. So again, we'll be with uh, Liz's group at Caramore in the Venetian Theater, which will give us a, a wonderful opportunity to do it outside for the first time, uh, sort of in, in, in the indoor-outdoor space. And then we get another outdoor space at the amphitheater at Chautauqua where we'll have an opportunity to perform in the thrust really for the first time because that wonderful space is, is in three sides. And I spent seven years at Shakespeare's Globe. So the thrust is really where I feel most at home. And it's, it's a wonderful opportunity for us to really open up and to be really all inclusive with the story. So I think um, Kathy's venue will really test us in reaching the back row. And then, uh, and, and Deborah's uh, venue will really reap the benefits of the lessons we learned at the Venetian. Uh, so it's really, it's, it's going to be fabulous for us. Great. So Liz, coming back to you for a moment, you touched upon this a little bit before, but tell us a little bit about how you feel. Do you feel that things are changing for musicians of color in classical music? I do think things are changing, but like any advances we've made throughout history, you take two steps forward and there's a step back. So right now, especially in 2020, when we dealt, uh, when we were all confronted with anti-Black racism, with the murders of Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, and especially George Floyd, when the entire world was shocked into action, uh, that's when all of a sudden you saw um, a 180 degree turn with so many classical music organizations. Now, I don't know how sincere many of them are, but suddenly everybody's uh, programming Black composers. So suddenly every orchestra I know uh, is suddenly discovered Florence Price, Margaret Bonds, uh, you know, George Walker, Jesse Montgomery, um, you know, past and present Black composers everywhere. So much so that sometimes it was even hard to find music. But then with every advance we make, uh, then you have some backlash. So we're starting to see a little bit of that now. So I do think things will, will eventually get better for us. Okay, thank you. So Kathy and Deborah, let's bring you two into the conversation now. So tell us a little bit about why you decided to present the Chevalier Project. And Kathy, let's start with you first. Um, well, 
it was brought to my attention by uh, the group touring this production, and it immediately struck a chord because the issues that Liz just raised were in the forefront of our mind and, and, you know, wanting to bring many of these uh, composers of color to our stages, uh, particularly, you know, in the classical realm, because we do present a lot of different kinds of music at Caramore. Uh, so it just seemed perfect to sort of form the cornerstone of, of our summer season this year uh, to bring a piece like this. We actually have not done uh, sort of theatrical work like that. This, we have done staged operas, but this will be new for us. And since we don't, we're not an orchestra, we're a venue, I reached out to Liz uh, about bringing the Harlem Chamber players on board, which seemed just like the perfect fit. I didn't really feel like we, we should bring in a whole group of white musicians to do it. Um, so thankfully that all worked out and we're just so, so looking forward to it. Great. So Deborah, what about Chautauqua? Well, I was really excited to learn more about this piece when, when my friend and colleague Kathy called me. We are at Chautauqua always looking at programming that um, I would say that convenes a conversation and at Chautauqua, it's, uh, of course, more than a music festival. And so even though I certainly love art for art's sake and music for music's sake, at our core, we are about critical conversation and trying to gather people, trying to convene people. And so when I was introduced to this piece, I was so drawn to the fact that it was not only a story, but it was also a piece that was trying to not just present and have a conversation, but I really feel that this piece in the way that Bill's conceived it is about driving us towards action, okay. right? That it's showing us about this incredible life, but it's also showing us some of the erasure that's happened in classical music. And it's also calling us to dig deeper and to learn and to rediscover history that's been lost. And so it's because of all of those things that I was so fascinated about the story and the larger action that it calls for. The other thing that made me really attracted to it for Chautauqua is that we do have our own resident orchestra. We do have our own resident theater company. We will be working with um, the wonderful actors that come with um, the Chevalier. I will miss not having the Harlem Chamber players, but Darn. because we have our own orchestra and residents, of course, we're trying to always bring new repertoire to them. In our orchestra, um, it's, it's a a constant learning process where even though it is fairly easy to always look at having diverse repertoire and diverse guest artists, we have a long way to go with our orchestra and how we represent our institution on stage. I'm sure you know, everyone knows it is, it's slow to change the membership of an orchestra. And we are really committed to saying, what else can we evolve in our institution and how can we continue to push things forward so that we are being transparent about how far we have to go? Great. So now I understand, Kathy and Deborah, why uh, each one of your organizations are interested in this wonderful project. But so tell me a little bit about how does it happen that you're doing this together? So Deborah, why don't you go first? Great. So um, Kathy and I began talking as particularly during COVID festivals started reaching out to each other. Um, and Caramore and Chautauqua came into conversation with other festivals to try and help each other through that difficult time. And we found that even though we were in touch little bits before, like so often happens in the world, we almost had siloed efforts to be doing good work. Oh, interesting. And what we discovered was that, of course, a lot of us are trying to do the same work, the same repertoire, to hire some of the same artists. And I believe that now, after going through this period of having so much isolation and separation, that what we see happening in the world and what we hope to have happening ourselves is to do more things in partnership. That when you look at this piece, it's not just about one story or one piece. It's really about saying, how can we all join together on larger issues of reclaiming histories that have disappeared or proactively been buried? How can we join together to amplify voices that need to be at the table and need to be heard? 
And I find that it's not only more enjoyable, but I think it's more powerful to do that in partnership. So I was really grateful for, for Kathy giving me a call about this. Oh, that's fantastic. So Kathy, give us your perspective on the partnership. Yeah, I mean, really, I just echo everything that uh, Deborah said. And I'll just say that even where we're not working in partnership in such a close way like this, the colleagues that I've been in touch with, particularly in the last two years, about these issues um, have been really inspiring. And, and there is a very um, enthusiastic group of us that are, are really wanting to, to dig into these topics and into this work. Um, and so I do feel very positive about it. Um, it's, it's not gonna be always in the forward direction, as Liz said, but um, I'm, I'm really inspired by how many of us are thinking about it and, and doing this work. So whether we actually collaborate together the way we are, or we just are in discussion with each other constantly, um, that's what I try to do with my, my peers in the, in the business. Great. So Kathy and Deborah, one more question for the two of you. So Kathy, we'll start with you. Kind of give us, you know, some examples of other efforts and hopes that you're hoping to work on that will help play a role in diversifying classical music. Yeah, well, I mean, it's been such a learning journey for me, again, to learn about all these composers who I also was completely unaware of uh, and com just completely ignorant about. Um, and we have programmed a great number of them this summer and, and trying to move even beyond, you know, the few who's, who've risen immediately and have risen. Florence Price, Florence Price, you know, yes, we've got some Florence Price, but really trying to educate myself by talking to musicians. Luckily, we, we present such wonderful people at Caramore and I can go to an artist like Janae Bridges and say, you know, what, what would you like to do her? And, and the, the repertoire is just going to come naturally. We have Imani Wins coming. We have the Talia String Quartet. We're bringing um, Anthony McGill, uh, just so many artists. And they're, they're just bringing this music to us. So I, I don't, it makes my job very easy. But you have to, um, to look carefully for the right artists to bring and, and let them know that you're open to it. So this is something that this is just a first step for us. We hope to continue in this direction uh, for the future at Caramore. It's very exciting to me. Okay, so Deborah, what about Chautauqua Institution? Well, you know, I had I had mentioned it during, during our last section of the chat that um, I felt with our orchestra, I just wanted to recognize how far we have to go. And so I guess with, with that recognition, I'll say that it was about five years ago that we started our first uh, diversity fellowship program oh, okay. in the Chautauqua Symphony Orchestra. And we started that because we found in our other program areas, and specifically our other arts areas, a lot of them were extremely diverse in the genres and repertoire they presented, in the performers, guest artists, and residence artists that they had, even in their staff. And I found that it was much more challenging in the orchestra because in that field, and certainly in our orchestra, once you're tenured, it can be a lifetime job. Mm -hmm. And so when you decide to uh, make changes that can happen more fluidly, more flexibly, or faster in other arts areas, I found that that wasn't the same simply because of this tenure system in the orchestra. And so because we couldn't really address that within the collective bargaining agreement, we did what many orchestras have done and said, okay, how can we surround that? And how can we still try and say, if the mission of Chautauqua is to explore the best in human values, mm -hmm. then we need to have that conversation with a larger group of humans, a more diverse, a broader group. And so this diversity fellowship started um, five years ago where we would invite um, five musicians that were underrepresented into the orchestra for the full season. Okay. That has been such a wonderful learning process for us, a growing process for us. It is this much of where we'd like to see ourselves. Okay. Um, so I would say for us, that diversity fellowship program is key to where we would like to grow. Um, and it goes right alongside with Chautauqua's strategic plan. In our strategic plan, one of the most important cross-cutting imperatives is IDEA work. Mm -hmm. Inclusivity, diversity, equity, and accessibility, 
We are now led by our uh, chief diversity officer in many of these efforts, where we are looking at not only classical music, but all of our program, our community, and ourselves, and the lens that we bring to things and how we need to evolve that lens. Um, so for me, this piece, our orchestra, are just small pieces in how we need to grow as, an, as organizations, um, both to take responsibility for finding how do you have that deepest conversation with the most diverse audience possible, because that's how we are our best selves. Okay, wonderful goals for both of your organizations are fantastic. So, so Bill, let's bring you back into the conversation as well. So what happens after the Chevalier? You go first. What happens after the production? Yeah. What are your hopes for the piece and your company? You know, do you think diversity in classical music will continue? What are some of the things that you're hoping for post piece? Well, my eye is on what we decided to do in Concert Theater Works uh, in order to make this not just a production that comes into town and leaves. We're supporting the National Alliance for Audition Support, which is an arm of the Sphinx organization, um, which provides targeted audition grants for deserving musicians of color to audition for major orchestras around the world. And this speaks to exactly what Deborah was just talking about. It's not a pipeline issue. This is not the reason why there aren't more, more, more people, um, more black and Hispanic people in orchestras in the US, but there are a couple weak links in the socioeconomic chain that inhibit these players from finding these opportunities. And the Sphinx organization, the base of Detroit have identified one of those links as auditioning. And I'll, allow me just for a second to pull the curtain back on the world of trying to get in one of these tenure track orchestras. Not only do you have to pay hundreds of thousands of dollars to educate yourself and to train private lessons for at least 10 years, typically, but then you have to audition for these uh, organizations that require you to fly to a place with your instrument, get a hotel, or maybe stay in the hotel for a week or two through callbacks. And you might have to do that 10 or 20 times before you get one of these positions. And the cost is onerous. And the, the, the fact that the cost is a requirement is an example of systemic racism. It's just behind the racial, racial fault lines is the socioeconomic fault lines. And they often, as we know, correlate. So what the National Alliance for Audition Support does is it pools money from participating orchestras in order to give out these audition grants to try to allow these musicians of color to audition for orchestras until they get these jobs. And originally, I decided that the Chevalier would only perform with orchestras who were members of the National Alliance, which they call the NAS. And it's, a, it's not complicated, but basically there are about 100 orchestras that participate that give an annual fee. And that annual fee creates a pot of money that then allows them to give out grants. The NAS does a lot of other things, but that's basically it. But then I realized that it wasn't just the Chevalier that had to operate this way, but Concert Theater Works, my company, and all of our shows, we have about 12 shows, and all of our shows would only work with orchestras that are members of the NAS. And if an orchestra is not a member of the NAS and they can't afford it, we write a check and we sign them up. So we've done this with a couple orchestras so far, and uh, we are really a, a, an example of a sort of pledge that we're hoping other artists take because conductors, soloists, composers, staff members, librarians, uh, audience members, donors can all do this. They can all say, I, only, I will only support an orchestra that's a member of the NAS. And again, when we started this, there were 88 orchestras now, they're about 115. Uh, very fortunately, uh, Sphinx and uh, the NAS have benefited from this groundswell of attention that's being uh, placed to our great blind spot. And Liz just articulated that so, so beautifully. But uh, there's more that we can do. And we hope that other people um, uh, do what we're doing and only perform with orchestras that are members. And if they're not, sign them up, make them aware of it. Because if all orchestras are participating, then more of these deserving musicians can audition. And, and hopefully more and more orchestras around the country will start to look like the audiences they seek and deserve. Bill, that's fantastic. Liz, let me ask you a similar question. So kind of what are some of your hopes? I know you've spoken to this a little bit, you know, post the Chevalier, you know, what are some of your hopes about diversifying classical music and continuing to work on that? 
uh, just um, I, I'm a little floored by Bill's response to that. It, that was just so amazing uh, what you're doing. But my hope uh, with our organization, which is small, and we're trying to grow into a mid uh, mid sized organization. But I would like to see musicians of color. Uh, getting more jobs in in the larger institutions, uh, just as Bill was talking about. And I've seen some of that happening uh, as some of the musicians get a little bit more exposure that uh, places who have never called them are starting to call more musicians of color. And I just want to see that continue to happen. Fantastic. So, Kathy, Deborah, anything that you want to speak to as the organizations that employ these people and commission these particular pieces? Sure, I'll, I'll give Kathy the last word. Okay. So, since Bill brought up Sphinx, it's just such, such a critical organization, um, not just right now, but in, in starting many of these conversations long ago. And one of the things that I've been really grateful uh, for with Sphinx organization is that they have also put out really the first guidelines um, just within the last year for orchestras on, on tenure and placement and audition guidelines. Mm -hmm. And exploring that, not only with our administration, but in conversation with our musicians, it's a springboard for pretty serious and significant discussion. Um, we have been talking, so staff and musicians together, and I am not saying it's easy conversation, but it's important conversation. And we've been talking about how do you take those guidelines and best apply them to the Chautauqua Symphony Orchestra. Along with that, we've been taking a look at um, some of the other things that we do in the orchestra, such as the Diversity Fellowship Program, and actually moving that partnership, which used to be with one symphony and one university, which was wonderful, and we're actually shifting that partnership over to Sphinx so that our fellowships are accessible to anyone that applies through Sphinx rather than only one institution or one symphony. So we're trying to really... Um, question ourselves on equity across the board. Um, we understand this is just one step, but it makes uh, it encourages us that we're making these steps with other organizations such as Sphinx. Okay. And Kathy, you do get the last word on that question. Well, um, I guess I just want to add to that. I, I don't work in the orchestra world as much. I'm primarily looking at soloists and, and chamber music groups. Um, and I guess I would just say that I've become so aware of my own biases that have just been with me since, you know, my youth of, of hearing music played by certain artists in a certain way um, for many, many years, which sometimes, you know, you, you hear another artist now play something in a completely different way and you, you, it's very easy to dismiss as well. This is not the way that I learned that this should be played. And I'm finding it really interesting to sort of dig into that for myself um, and others to see wh why we, we think <laughs> that that way that we heard it played um, is how it should be played. And I just, I think this is another factor that we have to put into this whole thing so that even some of those artists that are auditioning for orchestras may not be coming at it with the same background um, as, as others and orchestras may be listening for a certain thing. And, you know, why, why should that be the case? Um, I'm, I'm really fascinated to hear different interpretations of all sorts of things, different ways of playing, uh, even, the, even Beethoven. So um, yeah, I'll just leave it with that. It's, it's been a fascinating, fascinating, uh, journey and it will continue for all of us. Fantastic. So Kathy and Deborah, one last question for the two of you. And Kathy, we'll st start with you. Tell us the mission of your organization and how this fits into that end. Oh, gosh. Um, I don't have our mission statement uh, memorized, but um, I will just say that we are all about live music um, in, a, in a very special setting that we have. Uh, but it's really about live music and experiencing that of all kinds, many genres. Um, and so this, this just fits in with our, our wanting to bring a really, really broad spectrum of kinds of music, of musicians to Caramore. Um, and so people can enjoy them. And, and we will be um, 
working on obviously this this DEI work throughout our staff and our board and and many other aspects too. But for me, it's all about the music on our stages. Fantastic. So Deborah, so how does the Chevalier project fit into the mission of Chautauqua Institution? In, in every corner of the project, it fits into the mission. So at its core, our mission is to explore the best in human values through program. And for Chautauqua, our main pillars are education, arts, religion, which is expressed through interfaith discussion and recreation. And at our best, when we're doing any one of those program pillars, it's a springboard for coming together and having conversation. It is not a requirement that we agree in conversation, but it is a requirement that we gather people with different perspectives and that we explore things and that we challenge ourselves. We have an audience that's typically very curious, and that's what I think this piece feeds. This piece is about sharing a story but it's also about that springboard for conversation to say, okay, this is about an artist activist, as Bill said. And I think as people explore that story's story, it will ask us to explore ourselves to say, am I an artist advocate? Am I a citizen artist? Am I a citizen advocate? And what can I learn from this life that's going to affect me now where we are in this world within my community? Um, so I think that conversation is what Chautauqua is about, and I think that's the real gift of a piece like this and the incredible collaborators that are coming together for it. Great, fantastic. Well, Deborah, Kathy, Bill, Liz, thank you so much for joining us with this fantastic conversation and very important issue that you all have done very well to elaborate. I know that we all are really very enthusiastic to see the Chevalier and to explore the story of Joseph Boulogne. It's been wonderful to connect with all of our panelists today and learn about this important work being done across organizations for the arts. For more information on the Chevalier's performance on July 10th, visit caramore.org. And for the July 16th performance, visit chq.org. We hope that this conversation encourages you to attend a live performance of the Chevalier and in turn, those performances inspire you to join this movement of equality and diversity in classical music. I'm Sylvia Bennett from Buffalo, Toronto Public Media, and it has been my pleasure to host this conversation.